also throw this one in as well. That our government has signed up for an 80% reduction in carbon by 2050. And I challenge you to think about how you would do that. How would you reduce 80% of your carbon by your present lifestyle? What would you give up? How would you change? We aren't even on first base in achieving that at the moment. And th these figures, I gave this to the students uh, from Sheffield last week. Uh, the UK, our lifestyle, you can argue about the exact figure, whether it's 5.8 or 7, but somewhere in that range. That's the amount of land that every member of British society requires to provide you with your food, your energy, your home, and everything else that you require to live to the standard of living you expect. The world, and I just did this, after the presentation, because somebody asked me for the details, so I, I, I upraised it to 7 billion from 6.5 billion people. Uh, it was 1.9 hectares per person in the world, it's now 1.76 hectares per person, uh, and it's heading towards 1.2. So that's where the three planets comes from. In fact, it's slightly more than three planets. If everybody lived to Britain's lifestyle, lifestyle we'd need three planets to supply our needs. But Britain only actually has 0.4 hectares per person. So the sustainable population of Britain is actually three and a half million. If, if we provided all our needs for the British land, we'd only support three and a half million people, which is a very scary fact. So in fact, in Britain at the moment, we need to keep 60 million people, we need 16, 16 Britons. And by 2050, we keep the same standard of living, and we get to 78 million people, which is what the prediction is, we will need 20 Britons to supply our needs. So Britain is very, very dependent on the rest of the world. Oil production, you know all that. Have we passed it? Are we there yet? Pink oil? We have a farming system that is totally dependent on oil. Uh, Patrick Holden, uh, I, I think I disagree with him, but he thinks that uh, you've won the argument that organic farming is the way forward. Uh, and that the next problem is how do we manage farming without oil? And oil also provides a lot of our fertiliser. And fertiliser prices have trebled in the last two or three years. And that's due to the fact that demand has increased, uh, more countries requiring fertilisers to mechanise their farming, and fertiliser is running out. There isn't an endless stock of it somewhere. We're actually running out. Potash is a classic. And big corporates are buying up the bits of potash that are around so they can secure huge profits in the future. Pesticides, all trace elements running out, all these things are, are happening around us and we're not doing anything. Uh, not a very clear picture, I just grabbed this off the internet uh, yesterday because so I couldn't find my normal slide. This is the Peak District, the White Peak. And, and I spent a lot of my time in the Peak District. I was a nature reserve warden in the Peak District. And back in the 70s when I was a nature reserve warden, uh, through into the, well, into the early 80s, the farming of the Peak District, encouraged by government policy, went from uh, relatively low intensity farming uh, with a landscape that was wonderful. I used to walk through fields uh, that were full of flowers, uh, surrounded by insects, surrounded by butterflies. I used to do butterfly surveys counting 15 species of butterfly. I would see ground nesting birds in their thousands. I could cycle to Tideswell and clap my hands and a thousand lapwing would take off, circle around and land again. It's gone. It no longer exists. Anybody much younger than me will never have seen it, will never know it existed. And the national park system we set up didn't notice because they still they were planners, they were architects, landscape architects, they were administrators, and to them the grass was still green, therefore it was all right. But what has happened is we went from haymaking to silage. The grass never seeded. The ground nesting birds are gone because they, the grass is cut before they nest. They, they were chopped up if they were there, uh, and it's totally dependent now on. Uh, man-made fertilisers to keep that farming system viable. So it's no longer sustainable. And I, kept, I went to a conference in Canada and, and heard some amazing things that were happening in Africa and in South America and Central America where nature had a real value. 
And a lot of organisations who were funding that work and that research, like WWF, weren't telling people in Europe about it, particularly in Britain, because they were scared stiff that people who donated the money to fund their organisation would stop funding them, because it often involved killing animals. But it involved killing animals in a sustainable way that enabled those animals to survive in harmony with people. And I came back to Britain and thought, why aren't we doing it here? And came up with my business model, economic conservation, or e-commerce. And in Britain, conservation is about either goodwill or grants. And I think it can be about an economic driver. We, you can make money out of land, managing the land sustainably and appropriately. <coughs> so Econs was the business I set up. E is economic. C is community or the social leg. N, natural, is the environmental leg. The three elements that are widely regarded as being key to sustainability. And in the middle, if you get the balance right, you have opportunity. The sum of the parts is greater. So my wife and I, having sold the business I was running at the time, an agricultural contracting business, uh, we finally bought Hill Holt Wood, because we tried to find partners like the National Trust who would supply the land to allow us to try the model. And nobody was interested, so we thought the only way to do it was to do it ourselves. Hill Holt Wood is a 32-acre uh, wood in Lincolnshire, and we started a business, but immediately started to link to the community. And that worked very well. And it grew from four villages around us to 12 villages in the space of five years. And I, I mentioned to Pam about my links with the Forest Commission, which go back quite a long way. And I've been attending various events run by Forest Research and the Forest Commission, and one of them uh, by Forest Research was about social forestry, uh, a very new idea. And it was about um, it talked about the Arnstein scale. Uh, Sherry Arnstein was an American planner who came up with a way of judging the level of community involvement. And the ladder that she used from one to eight, some, sometimes it's one to nine, starts with agency control and goes up to community control. And it goes through a series of <coughs> consultation levels. You know, we'll tell you what you, we've done. We'll ask you what you think to what we've done. We'd like you to ask what you'd like to be done, and it works its way all the way up to community control. And forest enterprise managers who were at that meeting, with uh, only myself and a lecturer from De Montfort University, uh, everybody else was forest enterprise uh, manager, uh, all said that they felt the forestry commission was at three, and they might get to five on the table. And if they could only get to five, there was no way a private landowner would ever go as high as that. Why would they? So I stuck my hand up and said, I think I'm at five already. And I came away from that determined to get to eight, to actually hand over to the community. And within a year, we'd handed over to the business to a social enterprise uh, with, with a, a, a governance was one of the things I was to talk, talk about. So we've come up with a structure where we are a membership organization. Anybody can join. They have to sign up to our aims and objectives. They can then they go in a different category, and then they can elect board members to represent them for the governance of the, of, of the business. It's now also a charity to protect the growing assets it's got. So we have seven individual directors, three corporate, which is any organisation or business or parish councils, two funders, well we don't actually have any funding, but we have two district councils who we work with, and they give us free advice, so we call that funding. So they, they, they have represented elected members on the board, we have two staff representatives who officially can't vote now in a charity, but they do. And then we have a faith director. And the reason we have a faith director was we found that a lot of the corporate and individual people were business people who volunteered to be on the board. And when I initially reported the, the profits at the end of the year, if they'd gone down, they'd go, oh dear, do we need to cut stuff? Do we need to make cutbacks? And you needed people to argue, this is about balance. Did we need to make that much money, or could we actually spend more of the money on doing good things? So you need the balance in the decision making. This is the cabinet office definition of social enterprise. I would say at this point that we are seriously talking about whether we redefine ourselves. Because I fear that the social enterprise 
model is being devalued, yeah. particularly by governments, because they're saying that organisations that do social good mm. but are private businesses can be called social enterprises. I absolutely categorically disagree with that. To me, a social enterprise is where the profits are reinvested in its social and environmental objectives. If that is not the case, it is not, in my opinion, a social enterprise. It is a profit-making business. And I'm afraid that some of the social enterprise ambassadors from the last government's programme owned the business and took profits from the business. They were not social entrepreneurs for me. They were socially aware and conscious business people. No problem with that, but don't call yourself a social enterprise. So we're thinking of actually joining locality and calling ourselves a community business, which is what we are. But it's all about choosing how you define yourself. We've been researched by the University of Leeds in great detail. We've also been researched by Forest, End, Forest Research and various other organisations. But this is my favourite one. And um, Brad Parrish, an American, looked at four businesses that were all environmental and looked at how the thinking process of those businesses worked. And he came up with what he called was a model of sustainable enterprise. Um, I think it's interesting that all four founders of those businesses were ecologists like me. And ecology is the study of complex systems and their interactions. So the businesses are very complex. Uh, number one is resource perpetuation, or perpetual reasoning as he called it, but it's very academic. Uh, the resource perpetuation is that you uh, don't just exploit a resource, you try and perpetuate it. So woodland's a great example, that you fell trees, you add value to them, but you plant more trees, the wood is always there. Benefit stacking is where you do one thing, it enables you do, to do another. So we're not a McDonald's business where we make burgers, and that's all we do. We do a huge variety of different businesses. And, and we're not bothered uh, when the accountants to the bankers say, oh, well, is this business making money and that business losing money? Quite frankly, I couldn't care less. All I'm bothered about is does the whole thing make a profit uh, and does the whole thing do good? And if this one does more good but doesn't make money and that one makes more profit, that's fine. Uh, strategic satisfying is that balancing. And I think we're very bad at training people how to do that, how to make these balanced judgments. Uh, do you, we don't maximise profit. We make enough. We don't plant endlessly plant trees. We plant as many as we have the capacity to do within the resources we have. So it's all about that balancing between these social, environmental and economic objectives. Qualitative management. We're always trying to do better rather than more. Unless more is better. So it's not about growth. The, the uh, uh, director of the uh, head of business school at Lincoln uh, describes the capitalist business model in its present form as uh, pyramid selling. Uh, eventually you run out of beans. We can't endlessly grow, so we have to rethink it. I'm not uh, a sort of ultimate socialist by any means. I believe business can be good. But the fact is it has to have different drivers than just making money. And finally, worthy contribution. Uh, I think there's another slide after this one that will help explain that one. <coughs> Systems thinking, I've done that. Um, what happens to the profits of the business? Caveat emptor, buyer beware. The full profit business. Uh, it's about power. As we've heard, literally in the last two days in Britain, that the directors of the top 100 companies in Britain, on average, earn £2.7 million a year because they have the power to decide what happens to the profits. Uh, in the case of a charity, Primum Non Nocere, those in greatest need first, it's about need. The more needy you are, the more you get. In the case of In Perpetuum, forever, the sustainable enterprise, it's about worthy contribution. So what we're about is activating people to work with them mutually and then they take a share of the worthy contribution for their efforts. So when it comes to working with unemployed young men, as we do a lot, we don't cuddle them, we kick them. We're very hard on them. And when they eventually work, we reward them. But they don't get the reward for nothing. We also apply uh, a rule that Plato came up with 2,200 years ago. Plato in Athens suggested the lot. 
that to live in Athens to a reasonable standard of living, you needed an amount of money, an amount of wealth. And nobody, he suggested, could earn more than four times the lot. And if you weren't more than four times the lot, you had to give it back to the city or give it away. And if somebody was found keeping more than four times the lot, all of it would be taken away from them and shared amongst other people. Uh, you might wish to know that the highest paid director in Britain, who works for a rather dodgy mining company, uh, earns 1,440 times minimum wage. I think the only one to describe that is obscene. Uh, this is my own home. And there are other ways of rewarding people than paying them money. And the fact that, I, that my wife and I got planning permission to build our house in an ancient woodland, on an island, in a lake, was due to the community supporting us and, and, and persuading the councillors who persuaded the planning officers to allow us permission to build. The house is off grid, like the whole site. Uh, it's very low cost to run, it's very low impact. But you can live with nature. I'm actually in favour of what the government's suggesting about green development. But what I'm not in favour of is the rules they're putting in place to do it. Uh, great when they say sustainable development. The trouble is they don't explain what sustainable development is. And I don't think the government understands what sustainable development is. Genuine sustainable development can benefit nature. So this is a kingfisher. On that post, right outside our house, we've got 10 species of bat in the wood, out of, I think, it's, is it 17 or 18 species. I suspect we could be a triple SI. The, what the, some conservationists don't really realise is the reason that they are there is because we are there. That humans can actually benefit nature. It's not about competition. You've just got to, to think it through. This is the building. Um, that now the community has in the wood. The hall is round earth, uh, and one of our businesses is a design team. Sam was one of the founder members of our design team. Um, we challenge our design team to use materials that are local. So British timber, which is often disregarded as a building material because it doesn't grow slow enough and it has too many knots, it doesn't grow straight. Uh, we say we'll design a building that uses the properties of British timber. So this, the roof of this, uh, and most of the timber in this building, actually comes from woodland trust sites that we manage for them for nothing in return for the timber. And it's not just about turning it into firewood, it's about turning it into real value. That's the, what we think is the only, it's actually a double reciprocal roof, we think it's the only one in the world that's inside that building. Also, I have to mention uh, this uh, event I went to. James Martin, who I'd never heard of before I went to this, is a very wealthy individual. He's Britain's leading futurologist. He predicts the future to businesses. So corporates paying vast amounts of money to tell them where the markets will be in the future, what will be the products that will sell. And he's used some of his wealth to fund, he's the biggest funder of Oxford University. Ever. Now that's big when you think of all the other people who like, like Saida, who's put money into Oxford. He's put millions and millions into Oxford. And he runs this Centre for Science and Civilization. And I was invited to join one uh, that was organised by Colin Tudge and was chaired by Sir Christopher Tickell. So look at two questions Should Britain feed itself? Can Britain feed itself? Should Britain feed itself? We all agreed yes. And obviously we're not going to grow bananas, but it's about, oh, yet, uh, but it's about uh, having a resilient food supply where we grow most of our food. And we had an amazing character called Simon Furley who was along at this event. And he's a brilliant and eccentric character who lives uh, in a very alternative community. Uh, he replicated research carried out by Britain's chief scientist in the 70s, Keith Mellonby. And he replicated that research six times with six different models. And he looked at intensive agriculture, intensive agriculture vegan, organic, organic vegan, permaculture, and permaculture vegan. And 
at the end of that, that work, and he, he did it very accurately, he came up with intensive agriculture, yes, we could feed ourselves, but it wasn't sustainable, we all agreed. Intensive organic, yes, but it uses every bit of land, not much left for anything else. Uh, the, the organic didn't actually stack up, pure organic, you couldn't feed Britain organically. Uh, and and he, he regarded the idea of uh, his change, he was a vegan, he's not anymore, he thinks animals have a role to play in a sustainable system. And, and the, the uh, meat eating but reduced meat consumption, permaculture, was the one that he felt provided the best balance, provided the best way of feeding, and it includes things like you've just heard about vertical farming, about urban agriculture, about growing in gardens, about growing on roofs, about a very, very diverse mixed system. But it does include a mix of, of uh, I, I, I won't go into it now, but, but uh, it does include uh, animals, a role for animals. <coughs> I'm clear about this. Uh, oh, we have line of cross. Yeah, line of cross. It's not, not come out properly. It's another one I grabbed. I lost my original slide, so I tried to grab some of these now on the train on the way here. Uh, this is the green brownfield argument. That is greenfield. Intensive agriculture in Lincolnshire, the county where I'm based, it means fields of 200 acres or more. It involves tractors uh, that are 600 plus horsepower that use 1,000 litres of diesel a day. And land that has nothing growing there apart from the crop. Uh, it's, it's not, not our focus. It's, uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's just a very low grade copy of the internet. Uh, nothing uh, growing, growing there or living there other than the crop, because it's intensive chemical based agriculture. So, what is wonderful about that that we should save it? <coughs> and this is regarded as brownfield, which is an allotment in an urban area, which is producing lots of food and a wonderful diverse habitat with lots of wildlife. And I think, I also, I, I think all the solutions will have to be local. Uh, it's no good when you're building giant power stations. You can't have combined heat and power, which is the logical way forward, with a 4 gigawatt power station. But you can with a small power station next to the town that uses waste, human waste, for instance, to produce biogas to run a power station. <coughs> And here's an example of blurring the boundaries. This is, I believe, I think I've got this all right. This is um, Detroit. And Detroit, with the collapse of the uh, car industry, a lot of the land is actually returning to be farmed. Because people have abandoned the city. And land values have collapsed, and house prices have collapsed. And you now get tractors in the middle of Detroit. So maybe that's the future. Maybe Detroit is the first 20th century city that's returning to something very different. I think community supported agriculture in all forms, which is what we're talking about here, also will be the future. Uh, uh, I think some amazing models, Stroud is a really good one, they're all very different. Uh, and I don't think there will be one solution, it's about what's right for, the, for, for a particular community. This is Hillel Wood. Uh, we have our own gardens in the wood. Uh, we produce all of our own food, we have our own kitchen now in that building. And, and we take these young people who come from very deprived areas, we teach them how to cook. Once they're cooking, they then get interested in growing. We found that we can't get them to grow without teaching them cooking first, because they think they're bonkers, and they haven't got the patience. They've got to be inspired by turning something into food and then eating it, and then they think, oh, yes, this is good. Now we'll learn about growing. Uh, this is a centre we're designing uh, in East Lindsay, near, near Lath, um, which will have um, a new market for the town, a new stock market, uh, and the idea is to put, uh, we actually want an abattoir there as well, but they think we're getting a bit, I think that's a bit too much. Uh, I put the abattoir there as well. So the idea is that you, you, you have the real localism, instead of shipping animals miles away to be processed somewhere else, let's do it all on the site and actually re-educate people and let them realise the benefits of local meat production and understand where the meat comes from rather than having it clinically presented to them in a supermarket. 
And finally, uh, this is a sustainable village we designed, designed on one of those greenfield sites. Uh, this is 150 acres of um, wheat field, where a farmer who has 3,000 acres, quite small still in Lincolnshire, uh, most farms in Lincolnshire are now 10,000 acres upwards. Uh, he was prepared to put this land into a community land trust. In return, they get a bit of development in the middle, here, uh, which he would get rents for, and in return for becoming the energy provider to the village. So he would become the utilities provider. He would provide electricity, heat, he would treat the water, he would treat the sewage. And, and as long as he got as good an income or a better income than he got from farming the land, he was prepared to do it. He wasn't looking for a capital gain, so he was prepared to transfer the land. And instead of building houses at 90 to the acre, the way the big developers do, it was about all the houses facing south, all the houses situated so they've got this ring road around the outside with access like this, so everybody can walk to the middle of the village without crossing a road. And we wanted to demonstrate that the, when the village was built, you would actually grow more food on the land after you'd built 300 houses than before. Because you would grow uh, by horticulture and, and by mixed methods rather than just growing feed wheat, which is what grows on the land at the moment and actually doesn't feed many people. Um, environmentally, you have something vastly better than that single monoculture crop. Because you will have ponds, you will have hedges, you will have grassland, you will have gardens, you will have orchards, you will have huge diversity in that 150 acres. <coughs> and all that is doable now, but the reaction to the planning system in the local area was absolutely out of the question. You, it's not in the uh, regional spatial strategy, it's not in the local development framework, you can't do it. They would rather see, eventually named Barrett's, build 300 houses in a lump on the side of the town that was totally unsustainable, with houses that will only last for 50 years uh, and will cost a lot of money because they've got to make a big profit on the land. So Hillock Wood, uh, just to give you some figures um, on, on, on the business, Hillock Wood now turns over about £1.2 million pounds a year. It employs 30 staff. It has made, in total, uh, 1.1 million pounds profit in the 10 years since it became a social enterprise, and all that money is retained for the community. So all the assets are owned by the charity, by the community, by the business. And, and that's why I would suggest to anybody who's thinking about community agriculture or anything like this, don't be afraid of making money. It was actually a banker who said this to me. He said, well, I only asked for a small amount of money for giving some advice. He actually gave me three times as much. And he shook his head and said, I'm a very satisfied customer. He said, don't be afraid to charge. He said, Nigel, don't be afraid of money. You can do very good things with it. And what I want to see is a future where community businesses do make money and then do the right thing with the money rather than putting it into private individuals' bank accounts.